Thank you and welcome to the second inter-university debate interface. This is the third group that we are having in this segment. Uh, the first, in the first edition, we had Makere University, we had Kabale University, we had Kampala University and Bugema University. This is the second inter-university interface. And this is the third group. In this group previously, we had Chambogo University and Uganda Pentecostal University. Today with us, we are glad to have Ndeje University. I'm going to be your moderator today. My name is Lake Gender Fancy. I'm an advocate, I'm a tax consultant, and as well as a lecturer at Kulu University. So today we are going to discuss the topic, which is the enjoyment of civic and political liberties in Uganda. What are the bottlenecks? Today, Thursday, 21st, October, 2021. This debate is going to run from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And it is brought to you by Center for Constitutional Governments, that is CCG, and Civic Space TV. The debaters for today, we have when I, when I call your name, you can kindly put your video on and wave. We have Nyakais. We have Nyakais Siki Hillary. You can put your video on and you wave. Yes, can you see me? Yes, we, we can see you. Thank you, I'm Nyakais Siki Hillary. Thank you. Thank you, Nyakais Siki Hillary. Nakaisiki Hilary is a student at Ndejo University pursuing Bachelor of Civil Engineering. Secondly, we have Rajkara Felix Kakanda, who is also a student at Ndejo University pursuing clinical medicine. Yeah, thirdly, thirdly we have uh, Nyanzi Asa Victor, who is also a student of Ndejo University pursuing Bachelor's degree of mechanical engineering. Uh, Arthur, you can wave to us. Yes. Yes, I'm Nyanzi Thank you, Victor. And last but not least, we have Muchunguzi Arthur, Albert, sorry, Muchunguzi Albert, who is pursuing bachelor's degree in civil engineering. Yes, thank you, Albert. We can, yes, thank you, and see you. As earlier on stated, our topic for today is the enjoyment of civic and political liberties in Uganda. What are the bottlenecks? So that is what we will be debating today. And starting off to introduce this topic to you, uh, Uganda is a signatory to so many international instruments where civic and political rights and liberties are enshrined. Uh, most prominently, we have the International Covenant on, Civ on Civ Civil and Political Rights, and we have these rights enshrined under the 1995 Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, most specifically under Chapter 4. And we have seen several attempts that have been made to curtail the enjoyment of these civic and political liberties in Uganda. We have seen the introduction of Public Order Management Act of 2013, the NGO Act of 2016, the Computer Misuse Act of 2011, among others. So there has been a big concern that these actions have clouded back most of the gains that have been made towards an open society based on full enjoyment of rights and liberties. So that's why today, for our debate, we are going to discuss the topic the enjoyment of civic and political liberties in Uganda. What are the bottlenecks? So this, this is after that opening statement is going to be Nyakai Siki Hillary. Ms. Nyakai Siki Hillary, you're going to give us your opening statement in three minutes. And in your opening statement, you're going to answer the question, what do you understand by civic and political liberties. Hilary, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, our moderator today. So our topic for today's discussion 
is enjoyment of civil and political liberties in Uganda. And what are we talking about? We are talking about what the bottlenecks to enjoying these civil and political liberties in Uganda is. So for us to talk about the bottlenecks, it needs for us to first understand what the civil and political liberties in Uganda are refer referring to. So what is a right, first of all? A right is a legal and moral entitlement. And what are liberties? Liberty is the state of being free within society. This freedom is freedom from oppressive restrictions of the authority. So we, by this definition alone, we understand that sometimes authorities impose on us some restrictions that are oppressive, that are not useful to us as citizens. And what, what, in what relation is it going to be civic and political at once? Me, I want us to relate this to knowing um, the politics of Uganda as a country is meant to protect Uganda's citizens. So whatever the government is doing politically should be in line with the interests of protecting and empowering the citizens. And what about civil rights? Civil rights um, are with people's daily lifestyle, ways of life, ways of earning. Like these are things that people are entitled to, to have a livelihood that is worth living for. So my opening statement is done. Okay, thank you so much, Hilary, for your opening statement. Um, I am positive that we are going to have a very lively debate today. Thank you for defining for us what civic and political liberties mean. The second panelist is Rajkara Felix Kakanda to give us his opening statement. And the question that he's going to answer in his opening statement is, what is the current state of civic and political liberties in Uganda? Raj Thank you. Uh, I want to also welcome all of you uh, to this um, very debate. Uh, Nyanzi, um, Hillary, Albert, and of course our moderator, Lake Agenda. Thank you so much. Um, in 1776, Thomas Jefferson said that we hold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Now, this was the year which marked the conception of the idea of civil liberties and rights. 1950 marked the beginning of civil rights movement where we saw uh, African-American dominion actually uh, demanded be given equal protection and the law. So taking all this into account, we realized that our civil rights and liberties are actually results of many years of agitations and struggles actually done by people. Uh, whom we can now call the, the, the bearers of the ideas, okay, of uh, equal treatment or maybe uh, freedom uh, in the society and such freedoms that people were looking at uh, things like freedoms of speech, freedom of um, assembly, I think as, as our technical team sorts out that, we might have to move on to the next person. Kakanda, are you, are you back? Okay, uh, we'll have Kakanda back at a later time when uh, his issues are sorted out. Let us have opening statement from our third panelist, that is Nanzi Arthur Victor. Uh, Nyanzi Arthur Victor, you're going to give us your opening statement in three minutes, and you're going to feature also a question. Kindly answer uh, the question of how important are civic and political liberties in your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity and for having us here today. Um, I, I, I really want to say that uh, 
we to to answer that question we need to first understand the fact why these rights even exist why do we have uh, these these liberties the civil and the political uh, liberties and that reason is to protect the the population of a country to protect different individuals from the influence from from intervening with with the uh, uh, with certain liberties to to avail these freedoms to the people so that if the government uh, and individuals and different corporations that may hold power in this uh, jurisdiction, uh, they, they do not affect how these people operate and, uh, for example, have access to their freedom. I want to use an example of uh, our right or the freedom of expression. Um, people have different opinions and they're entitled to have different opinions. And this, this liberty allows them to to, 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 to exercise and, and share their opinions with everyone and whichever media they want to use. So these rights are put in place to, to act as the government and different individuals and organizations to protect uh, uh, people's uh, different liberties, as, as they have mentioned, because there are so many different liberties people can have uh, politically and also uh, civically, because we know that uh, uh, civil civil rights are concerned with the day-to-day -day life of uh, a civilian in a country. So uh, a, a right to religion, the government has no right to, to interfere with that. So these ones guarantee that a citizen uh, is able to live in a country uh, and, and they are able to enjoy a good life. For example, the right to life, uh, the government has no opportunity, it has no right, it has it, it is not part of its jurisdiction, however much it does not like anyone, it does not have the power, it, it should not have the power to come and kill them, even if I, I, I really hope uh, we, we see that um, uh, the import that these 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 rights are very important to us because they they act as a fence, a restraint uh, to stop the government from intervening with the day-to-day -day life of different individuals. And also, uh, going to the political side, we see that uh, uh, these rights are, are able to guarantee that people can participate in uh, free and fair elections. It is really important for a country to have free and fair elections, uh, uh, stemming right from um, campaigning period also allowing people to vote for whoever they want, allowing people to, um, uh, and these votes that uh, they are really accounted for. And if there are any regularities, then the after election petitions are also handled well. So these rights are, are, and liberties are there to protect uh, such proceedings. They're there to protect, for example, um, right over uh, the, the freedom of association. It is, it is there to allow people to associate with, with whatever they want, whatever they see uh, uh, groups them better or identifies them better. So I really think uh, these rights are important to develop uh, a country to, to help um, uh, in education in, and the overall development, both economically and financially and also uh, politically to achieve uh, a more democratic society in Uganda because uh, if, if, if the government is restrained and it knows that we, we do not have to cross this line, we cannot cross this line because we do not have uh, such power over the people. However much they are interfering with us, however much, because sometimes the truth is bitter and it is a, a common secret that uh, so in many governments, uh, when someone mentions some, something, the people in power do not want to hear, they would, they would actually, or they would, uh, in this case, try to make them keep quiet. But if they know that people are entitled to their freedom, they have that liberty of expressing themselves, I see that it also provides a positive criticism to the people in power. Because if someone is able to mention their mind, and maybe it is a point of view or perspective these people have not actually seen, I see this as an opportunity for a, a government to collect ideas uh, from the people because people can actually mention out what is really happening, what they think should be done about different uh, uh, things in the country. Uh, point in case, I, I really hope you've, you people have heard of these uh, radio programs uh, where people can call, where, where they invite panelists. Uh, that is why I want to, to thank the Center of Constitutional Governance, uh, which has put up such a uh, such an occasion whereby we as young people are able to express and also exercise our liberty and freedom or, of expression so that we can mention what we think should be done so that we can uh, be there to show what, what, what is not being done right so that uh, putting all these matters into consideration we are able to, to, to develop our country and achieve a higher society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Victor, we, for, for giving us the importance of, of civic and political liberties. Um, earlier on, we 
we listened to the definition of civic and political liberties from Hillary. I would like to bring Kakanda back um, so that we give him a chance. He was explaining to us the current state of civic and political liberties in Uganda. Thank you so much, um, Jenda. Uh, I will go straight. I think there is something happening with the network and uh, somehow I'm getting locked out. So uh, I'll go straight to answer the, that question. Uh, number one, we realized that the idea of civil liberties our civic liberties is actually supposed to protect the people from the government, such that government may not have that time to oppress uh, the people. Like when we talk of free freedom of expression, uh, such that it gives an opportunity for someone to actually say out their mind, uh, in particular to maybe the state of uh, the nation or maybe what is happening around them. And it includes those things that are negative on the government that actually do not please the people uh, in the society. Uh, things like um, uh, the right to a peaceful uh, demonstration, okay? It's, it, it's a way of people expressing their feelings. So I think that um, that is what civic uh, liberties is supposed to protect. Now, talking of the current state, I, I feel that um, the government of Uganda has actually come short uh, as far as granting uh, the freedom uh, of maybe uh, liberties to, to, to its citizens uh, is, is concerned. Uh, we have seen this in so many cases, uh, particularly uh, or mostly uh, during uh, campaigns and maybe uh, certain amendments. For example, we saw in 2018 when Article 102B of the Constitution of Uganda uh, was to be amended. Um, that was before. Uh, we saw our activists uh, organization, Action Aid, uh, how their main office in Kampala was raided, how in the end uh, their offices were actually closed. And we also saw uh, when uh, the Citizens Coalition for Electoral Dem Democracy in Uganda, uh, SEDU, in, um, in 2019, uh, I mean, 2000, yes, 2020, around July, around July of 2020 coming to, to, to February there. Um, their offices were actually closed by um, by the electoral commission, uh, saying that um, what they were saying or maybe their activities were actually in favor of the other party and does not actually give grounds uh, to the government. It it says all it does is actually oppose the government. So I feel that we have actually come short uh, as far as granting these liberties is actually concerned. We have seen how. And the harassment actually geared towards opposition leaders, Chagulani being arrested. So many times we saw uh, in the work to work protests of 2016, okay, uh, uh, 2011, when uh, Dr. Kiza Besige, how they were spraying pepper sprays and maybe tear gas. Uh, this previous election also we saw um, in Ajumani, uh, in Gulu, where Chagulani's campaign were actually uh, dispersed by police uh, under the public management order. So uh, I really think that we have actually come short and uh, the current state is alarming. Um, I don't say, I, I wouldn't wish to say that there is actually, there is partial freedom, there is partial freedom being granted, but there is an extent where government actually now um, puts uh, direct influence and uh, goes against uh, against the rights and freedom that the people are supposed to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kakanda, uh, for that insight on the current state of civic and political liberties in the county. Kakanda presents um, a state that is worrying when it comes to civic and political liberties in the country, even when there is some little freedom being granted, if I captured him well. We would like to bring in Mr. Muchunguzi Albert uh, as the fourth panelist, who is going to give us his opening statement in three minutes, and he's going to tell us who are those responsible for the current state of civic and political liberties in Uganda. Okay, thank you, Madam Panelist. Uh, I'm Madam Moderator. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to take part in this uh, debate. 
uh, pertaining to the topic that we are having today, uh, the civil and uh, political liberties, what are the bottlenecks? Uh, one, one of the other things that we must first understand before we go any further, uh, what are the civil and political liberties? One of my one of my fellow participants or panelists has tried to explain to to explain to us what they mean. Uh, to add on something and then to move forth to what I have been asked, I want to elaborate literally about uh, civil and political liberties. Uh, civil and political liberties. Uh, these are class of rights that protect individual freedom from infringement of government, social organization, and political and private individuals, and which ensure one's ability to participate in civil and political life of the society. And more so, and the state of, uh, or and the state of being without any discrimination or being dis discriminated from a certain associ association or society. It can also be referred to as, uh, when it comes to civil liberties, it can be classified into, into more two classes, where we have civil rights that belong to, to public or that are, are, are allocated to public and individual civil rights. Uh, civil rights, including, uh, include, that include the ensuring of people's physical and mental in, integrity, life and safety, protection from discrimination, ethnicity, religion, or disability, all that is civil rights. Then, uh, actually, it is civil rights pertaining a group of people or the public. Then individual rights, as in regard to civil rights, they include privacy, the freedom of thoughts, conscious, speech, expression, religion, press, assembly, and movement. All those are civil rights. Then uh, when we try to talk about political, political liberties, these include natural justice in law, such as right of, of the accused, including the right of fair trial, due process, the right to seek uh, redress or legal remedy, and rights of participation in civil society and politics such as such as freedom of association the right to assembly the right to petition the right to self defense and the right to vote all those are the sorts of civil and political liberties that we are supposed to be having as in the country of ours Uganda as my fellow panelist has said, the current state of Uganda pertaining civil and political liberties is quite alarming. Is quite alarming. And uh, those who are, who, are, who are responsible for that, to me and in my view, I can say the government with its, with its uh, several departments regarding the protection of these civil political and political liberties is responsible for not keeping what is supposed to be kept for us for example i want to i, I want to, to 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 bring out this that uh, the government in this way with uh, an arm or even the even the sector pertaining to the fight for corruption or fighting against corruption, uh, it has failed to work upon the minimization of corruption or the corruption levels in Uganda, of which it has brought us to what we are facing right now. Partly, if not all of it, the government is responsible for the state we are in now pertaining the political and civil liberties. Thank you very much. That is my submission. Thank you so much to all the panelists. I must say that the debate is likely. I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, thank you for your opening statements. Now we are going to have the general question answered 
by all the panelists in five minutes each. The general question is the actual issue in this debate. And the question is, what are the bottlenecks to the enjoyment of civic and political liberties in Uganda? What are the bottlenecks to the enjoyment of civic and political liberties in Uganda? We are going to start straight away with Ms. Hillary. You have five minutes to answer that general question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope we can all see and hear me. Is that correct? Yes, yes, Ms. Hillary, we can see you. We can hear you perfectly well. So having gone through understanding what the rights are in this country and how the rights are being violated, we are going to talk about what are the bottlenecks to us freely enjoying the civil and political liberties in Uganda as we are supposed to as citizens of this country. Well, generally, I would say that the most important issue we have to address here is the current leadership structure of this country. Leadership is for the people, by the people, and for the benefit of the people most of all. But the leadership that we have in this country it's for benefit of individuals. I'm sorry to say this is offensive to anybody. I'm going to come down and let you understand this, understand what I'm talking about. We are going to cite issues that we've had with rights in this country, in our governance as from time memorial, as time goes on, yeah? Um, coming in to cite an issue of freedom of expression. This freedom has been violated so many times. Citing an example of the very first time uh, we saw Madame Stella Nyanzi arrested. She was uh, exercising her freedom of expression. And by the time she got to the point of arrest to undressing herself, she had gotten tired of trying so many times to be listened to and nobody was paying attention to what she was saying. People are getting frustrated because they are not accessing what they are supposed to. And what does this lead to violence resorting to means that are not right, that we would have not done otherwise. And this, ladies and gentlemen, I would say is the breaking point for us. Some people are pushed past their limits and they have no choice but to respond in the way that they're responding. We are also coming to cite a currently ongoing situation, citing the president's contest of bail, uh, giving bail to suspects, ladies and gentlemen. He talked about uh, crimes like murder are of high level, and the suspects should not be given a right to bail, ladies and gentlemen. And what is this telling you? He's trying to interrupt with the judicial system, with the rightful judicial system of this country. And in that way, he's infringing on these people's rights to a fair hearing, ladies and gentlemen, because everybody who is accused in the courts of law has a right to a fair hearing, to appear before the judge. but what is he doing? He's trying to threaten those people, force them into silence. We know that the Ugandan prisons are so full to capacity with people both who are rightfully and wrongfully accused. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, because somebody does not have the money to be able to defend themselves, they're going to die in jail over a situation that they were not even involved, um, supposed to be punished for ladies and gentlemen. And we know that the state is supposed to provide a free attorney, ladies and gentlemen, especially for those crimes like murder or high ranking crimes. You're supposed to be given an attorney if you cannot afford a lawyer as a citizen, ladies and gentlemen. But several times we've seen people thrown in jail and the next thing we know they're even dead there. Why is this, ladies and gentlemen? Sometimes there could be a cover up. Sometimes somebody could be wrongfully accused and the right people are walking on the streets and no one will ever know because somebody else's rights have been 
violated. What about the clause seven of chapter four of the national constitution, ladies and gentlemen? It talks about unlawfully arrested people, that unlawfully arrested people should be compensated either by the person who ordered for the arrest or by the authorities, if they're the ones who are arresting this individual, ladies and gentlemen. And what have we seen, ladies and gentlemen, there are several times that people, especially political figures in this country, fighting to give out their views, have been arrested, have been silenced, and there is always no compensation. For us, in this country, a citizen getting out of jail, releasing you after battering you up completely, that is the maximum compensation you will receive. Nobody is going to pay your hospital bills. Nobody is going to pay for your emotional damage, ladies and gentlemen. We've seen um, Madame Namboz. She was arrested. Betty Namboz, Madame Betty Namboz. She was arrested and her legs got issues. She was seated in a wheelchair for some time, but there was no compensation to her from the state, ladies and gentlemen. And what does this tell you? It has become usual in this country to violate our rights as citizens and we are not expected to speak up or fight when our rights are violated. Now, one of those bottlenecks to us enjoying our civil, civil and political rights and liberties is oppression through suppression of our voices, ladies and gentlemen. Several times the media has been made to filter, yeah, to filter out the people they can allow to speak on their media, televisions and radios. Um, there are several times the Forum for Democratic Change members have tried to go to radio, have tried to go to television, and those radio stations are even locked down if they air out their views, ladies and gentlemen. What is that? That is oppression through the media, ladies and gentlemen. They are trying to take away our rights and freedom of speech. And this way, we cannot speak out about the rest of our issues. And this is like making the situation way worse. Now, for me, the mainest issue that we have to address if we want to enjoy our civil and political liberties in this country is to address our leadership system, as I had stated earlier. And what do I want to change in this leadership system, ladies and gentlemen? We should be able as citizens to hold our representatives, our leaders accountable, ladies and gentlemen, for how we are treated, for the things that they do to us, for the laws that they are passing and the acts and the bills passed on. There are several times bills have been tabled in parliament and these parliamentarians make consultations with the people they represent, and later on in parliament, something different is, is brought out, something different from what was agreed at the grassroots is brought out, ladies and gentlemen. And how should we stop okay. this? Okay, Hilary, we... please, please summarize on that point. We shall get back to you on, on that point. Okay, could I please like close in on my submission? Yes, yes, please do. So, in conclusion, what I'm saying is we, if we want anything to change, we as the people have to hold our leaders accountable and we are going to be able to change this leadership system and make sure that what we are talking about, our rights, our freedoms are respected. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Hillary. I would like to bring in uh, our colleague, Mr. Nyanzi Arthur Victor, uh, to discuss with us what are the bottlenecks to achieving these civic and political liberties. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I'm loud and clear. First of all, I think that the biggest problem, of what is actually uh, limiting or what is bringing the problem on uh, civil rights yeah, is the fact that uh, uh, the biggest problem or the biggest bottleneck in this case, they are the people of this country. That is fair enough. 
take, take for example, Uganda is a democratic country. It is a country that takes uh, accord or that, that takes uh, the interest of the people so that it can work for them. But the biggest problem we have is that the people don't, is it they don't care enough or they don't mind? Why do I say this? Do you know um, if you carried out a survey on the streets of Kampala and told them that, do you know you have a liberty, you have a freedom? Because the, the word liberty means freedom, but, and you tell them you have a freedom to, 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 to say whatever you want using whichever media channel you want, and no one should touch you. People would be surprised. Why? So that is why I'm saying that the biggest problem that is affecting us from accessing our liberties is us. We are the problem. Why do I say this? People do not know. People do not know that they have these rights. Even our MPs do not know. In fact, you cannot tell me that someone knows that their liberties, that, like I said, civil liberties act as a fence or as a restraint to the government so that people can enjoy certain freedoms and rights. But then you see someone sits in parliament because they do not know that people have a liberty to say what they want. They have a, a, a right to associate. They have a right to, to, to group together and say whatever they want. Someone makes a public management uh, 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 act to limit and, and so that they can, ha they can have a grip on, on different groupings and uh, occasions of where people collect together and talk about things. I mean, if, if that person really knew, if the people in his constituency, because this is the law that was passed by parliament, Uganda has a parliament. Uh, MPs are representatives of people, but then someone goes and consults people, they give them consultation money, they go to consult people, they give them uh, 20 million, they go to ask people, what should we do? Because people don't know, they say no. You see, you see, you see where I'm going. So I see that the biggest, the biggest hurdle that we have to jump in this case is the fact that uh, uh, we, we, we have to know Number one, we, we as the people of this country, be it the MPs, be it the ministers, be it Museven himself or the president of Uganda, he should know that there's a limit to what the government can do. Because like I said, these are restraints. This is a boundary. He should not cross or the government should not cross at any one point in time. But then a, a whole cabinet can sit and say, no, we are going to remove a, a bail for capital offenders. And the, the, the cabinet has approved it this week or last week, something like that. And then we permit such a thing. And then they permit and they say, oh, what should we do? We should remove it. But as the, the cabinet, which is the, the arm of the government that is supposed to put in place, that is supposed to uh, put into action the laws that have been passed, we know that civil rights are already protected or, and they're integrated into the 1995 constitution of Uganda. But then these are the same things. People sit down and they say, no, let us remove this. But do they really know that these are lines the government is not supposed to encourage? So that is why I'm saying that the biggest problem is the people. You see, you see, like I said, when you when you do a, a survey on the streets of Kampala, people will actually be, be, be they'll, they'll, they'll be they'll be uh, surprised that they have such rights, that you have a right to do to, to go anywhere in this country. In fact, if Chagulani had you saying that you would. Uh, he, he, he would actually laugh because every time and again, people are doing this uh, because in Uganda here, even a right to life is, is also hard. Why am I saying this? We saw it in November when Chagulani was unlawfully arrested, violating uh, his, 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 his right of, uh, of free movement, his freedom of free movement within this country, which is also assured, which is also um, guaranteed and protected by the constitution of Uganda. He's arrested by law enforcement agencies. That is the, 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 the Uganda police and the UPDF. I thought they were supposed to put in place that law. But since people don't know, since people in the army also don't know that we are not supposed to do this, then how can that happen? So uh, the biggest problem is ask the people what, because I'm sure every one of us can do something. If, if, we, we, if, if we decide to say that, no, these rights must, must this is the line the government should not uh, actually cross, we, we can do something. I'm sure every one of us in, in their different capacities, we can do something. But then when someone speaks out, uh, people even uh, turn away from that person and say, ah, you take him, you take him. When they take him, we look the other side. And uh, not knowing that tomorrow you'll say something and you'll also be taken. Because we, we, do, not we do not know enough. Uh, one philosopher once said that uh, a man who knows cannot be in prison. 
because we do not know uh, our rights, we do not know that we have these freedoms in place, the government thinks it can violate them time and again. And because we've seen the election violence, we've seen favoritism, we've seen uh, the decrease in uh, political pluralism, that in, in actual sense, they, we say in theory that we have uh, different political parties that allow to operate in Uganda. But time and again, in 2019, uh, FDC failed to uh, hold its, its uh, annual general meeting, the one it holds in Nambole, and, uh, and, and no, no, one, no one cares. And people just kept quiet and said, no, it's okay for, for things like that to happen. So uh, I'm, I'm concluding saying that uh, our biggest problem, uh, the biggest bottleneck in this, uh, this point in time is that people, so it, we, should, we should be knowledgeable enough. We should, uh, we should uh, do some research and we should, every one of us, I'm sure there's something we can do uh, to solve this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Arthur, for that deep insight into the bottlenecks of civic and political liberties where he majorly said the main problem are the people. Let me bring in um, Felix Kakanda to as well debate this topic. What are the bottlenecks to the enjoyment of civic and political liberties in this country? Yes, uh, Felix, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Jen, the moderator for today. Um, this is a very crucial question uh, that uh, I feel must not only be answered by this team of Indeja University. I think this is actually a food for thought for our society and uh, to think about and see a way of uh, coming up with a solution to cap down the problem of civic uh, uh, liberties violation. I think one of the core values of Uganda as a country uh, is democratic governance, which was actually explained by Hillary. And uh, I think Nyanzi also talked about it, where we realized that uh, the government, we say that it is made by the people. It is made um, for the people also, okay? So in making this government, there is what we call a social contract theory that for whoever we vote into office, we actually give them power to make decisions for us, okay? But now these decisions are supposed to be in consultation with the community. Now that is where a very big problem now comes in as far as enjoyment of our liberties is concerned, okay? Now, the liberties that we are talking about today are things which we have mentioned earlier, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, okay? Religion, freedom of petitioning the government where they went wrong, uh, rights to a fair trial, right to privacy, okay? And right to equal treatment under the law. And now these are some of uh, the things. Now, we realize that Uganda has actually been operating uh, in a very dreadful manner, uh, considering it gov its governance as far as democracy is concerned, considering um, its people, okay, and uh, how they respond to a certain uh, environment uh, that may be created by government or uh, the people that actually uh, provides check and balance for the government. And the, of course, that is the opposition. Now, Uganda has a lot of things that it actually encompasses that enriches it to make it uh, what we call the Pearl of Africa. It's not just the beauty that most people want to talk about or maybe the tourist attraction or what. We have actually undergone through a lot of things to come here, to come today, to come to the developing, the developing country that we now talk about. So going back to the real matter uh, of, uh, of discussion today, uh, like my previous speakers have actually been saying, um, let me start by examining, first of all, the 2020 lockdown from March to 
to December. Now, we realized that during that period alone, um, around 66 people died just because of police brutality. And 12 of them were actually associated to the lockdown laws and how it was broken. Now, this makes me question uh, the ISO, Internal Security Organization, which actually are supposed to protect us. We saw during that period the deployment of uh, police officials in uh, trying to uh, manage the lockdown. And of course, the UPDF. Uh, we think these are people who are supposed to actually protect uh, the people of Uganda, okay? And see that whatever it is happening, not only what they're doing, but what happens to them is actually the right thing and constitutional, okay? You realize that one, Uganda is a country that subscribed to the Declaration of Human Rights. And one of the most important right is actually the right to life, okay? Leave alone liberties. Now, uh, coming back to the enjoyment of certain liberties. Um, I will begin with what Hillary entered on uh, in 2019, uh, where we realized around August, uh, when a, a, a court, uh, a court, one of the court actually uh, convicted and sentenced Stella Nyazi to about 18 months of imprisonment for cyber harassment. You can in court cyber harassment that. Uh, that was under the Computer Misuse Act for a poem that she published way back on Facebook in 2018, that it was actually criticizing the president and they say it was obscene and indecent. Now, we think this is a very, this is actually um, a violation of the right of expression, freedom of expression, okay? People are supposed to, enjoy the freedom of expression. It doesn't matter where such a person actually practice it, okay? Uh, what matters is have they actually expressed themselves in their expressing of themselves is their message that we are supposed to take from them, okay? Now, if there is a message, I think it actually provides check and balance to the government that, okay, maybe something could have happened and that thing was wrong. So we need to correct that. Okay, we need to actually listen to such a person, which is why uh, Hillary said this, this was a person uh, who was never listened to until uh, certain scenarios that I do not want to mention now uh, came to take, uh, to take place. In 2019 also, we, we, we saw also um, the regulation, new regulations on online operators uh, to apply for authorization to host blogs uh, and maybe websites. Okay, people were actually requested, they were not requested, required to apply to host blocks and website or you risk being what? Uh, shut down. And of course, other regulations which are given uh, by UCC directed to about 13 radio stations and TVs to suspend their staffs, accusing them of hiring, uh, of their hiring programs that were actually, they say it was unbalanced, that it favored only the opposition members it was actually giving more time to the opposition members as compared to the government so in a nutshell what i'm trying to say is that when we examine our democratic governance we realize that there is actually a very big problem where we we see things like misuse of powers and maybe state resources uh unlawful deployment of maybe the armed men you can take an example of house arrest. We saw that with uh, Dr. Kiza Besije. We saw that with um, uh, Honorable Chagolani, Robert Sentamu. So many times these things have been happening. Police brutality, dispersing um, crowds. And this has actually happened only, to my surprise, only to the opposition leaders or maybe in you know, opposition campaigns that, okay, especially during the lockdown, that we are in lockdown, you are not supposed to crowd. Wait for the president when he comes uh, to, to, to do his campaign. People are allowed, okay? And then you'll be like, now, what is the role of well, the police? That's, that's a nice discussion, but please conclude on that point. <laughs> thank you, thank you, yeah. So all I'm trying to say is that um, the core value uh, of Uganda, one of which was the is uh, democratic governance that I introduced and majorly talked about uh, in my in my session is that it is actually gravely violated and um, people cannot enjoy their liberties until certain corrections are actually made. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Felix. That was a very interesting discussion in there. We shall get back to you on that, but let's bring Albert into that discussion. So Albert, what are the bottlenecks to the enjoyment of civic and political liberties in this country? Okay, thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you for giving me this uh, another chance yeah, to give a little bit of highlight on the motion or the topic we are having today. Uh, pertaining the enjoyment of political and civic liberties in Uganda, the bottlenecks are quite various. But for now, allow me to point out these. Uh, before I go further, allow me to first say that corruption, misuse of authority and forces, or deployment of forces, and partial violence of several rights are the major bottlenecks in Uganda that are hindering the enjoyment of civic and political liberties. Uh, allow me, as I have already introduced the motion and the topic, allow me to go further deep into the its details to elaborate these points I have just pointed out. Pertaining to corruption, uh, in regard or in reference to the 1990, uh, in the 19, in the Constitution 19, uh, let me check, 1994, is it? 95, I think. Yeah, uh, regarding the civic rights and activities, one has a right to, exp to expression, one has a right to privacy, one has freedom to speech, one has freedom or right to self-defense, one has a right to assemble, one has a right to petition. All those are rights that we have civically and politically. But now due to corruption, there is no way you will face fair or just trial in the court. Why? Those with money will take up the lead. You won't enjoy what you're supposed to enjoy. Go to the courts of law. He who has money will win whether he was right or what he did was worth what is given to him but he who has money will win and the case will be will be done so what am i talking about <laughs> if we still have corruption in uganda and the government officials are still corrupt there is no way we shall enjoy civil and political liberties in Uganda. That is the number one thing to first fight, to have what we should have as in Uganda regarding to civic and political liberties. Allow me to further talk about misuse of authority and unnecessary or even unlawful deployment of forces. Uh, referring to to the campaigns of 2016, yeah, 2016, of Dr. Kizabe we'll remember that saga. He had no right to, ex to express himself. People have right to assemble. There wasn't a right to assemble. People have right to express themselves there wasn't any right to expression even in this in this recent saga of elections there wasn't that right and what does that mean the, all, all all of it up as i had told you the ones responsible for all these bottlenecks and the state of civic and political liberties in uganda being the government those who try to say something, 
to bring out something, to point out something that is not going on well with the side of the government. By all means, they are cut down. Yet they have a right to express themselves. Still, uh, 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 referencing to what general, what uh, uh, certain general whom I may not mention the name, after a certain saga in, in, in the recent elections and campaigns of Honorable Chagulanyi, after being arrested and some guys being shot dead, a certain general aired out on TVs that the army uh, or an, or an army officer has a right to shoot and kill you. That is something I have never seen such rascality. We have a right to express ourselves and the government, what it should do, it should just protect. As Mr. Nyans had elaborated, these civic and political liberties, they act as firewalls. They limit government to encroach this line. They limit individuals or public to encroach a certain line. Instead of the government deploying force to disperse those who are demonstrating, people have rights to demonstrate, provided they are unarmed. And most of the cases we have seen it in this country, people are demonstrating and they are not armed. But to my surprise, you see government, I'm at vehicles around, the guys are, are armed heavy, running after those who are demonstrating. That is unlawful deployment of the force. Misuse of authority. And we cannot enjoy our civic and political liberties when we still have such things happening in the country. We must have these things being taken down so that we can have what we are supposed to be having as in, in reference to political and civic liberties. As I finalize, allow me to, 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 to summarize this. Partial availance of several rights the constitution, the constitution states it clear that you have a right to vote. And yes, no one has ever been stopped to vote. You got the polling station, you vote. But what you vote, the results that you put in the ballot box, they are not the results that are read at the, at the charity centers. We partially have a right to vote. We partially, right, uh, have, uh, partially have a right to ex exercise a certain duties. But when in actual sense, even it is to zero rating to have that. You, you, we have we have been seeing these uh, these things happening but in the as, country. As you as you conclude on that point. Okay, sorry to take up a lot of time, but my submission would be in regard to these bottlenecks I have just elaborated. It's my task. Your task, it's everyone's task to come out and know what belongs to us and what doesn't belong to us. And we fight for what is ours. Thank you very much for God and my country. Okay. Thank you so much, Albert. And thank you to all the panelists for answering uh, the general question and giving us an insight into the bottlenecks to the achievement of civic and political liberties in this country. Now we are going to have uh, specific questions, which is the third step of our debate, which these questions will be directed to the panelists and you'll each have three minutes to respond to the questions. I'm going to start right from Miss Hillary to answer this specific question. And I would like to pick up from where Albert talked. We listened to Albert and most of his discussion geared towards the portion that has been played by the government, by the state in curtailing the achievement of civic and political liberties. And earlier on, Victor hinted on the people themselves being the one to blame for the different uh, acts that curtail this achievement of civic and political liberties. Now, I would like to bring 
Hillary at that point into the discussion. The question is, do you think that the citizens themselves should take responsibility for the current state of civic and political liberties in Uganda? Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Hillary. Thank you so much. So the question that has been posed to me is, should the citizen take matters into their hands in the way of achieving civil and political liberties in Uganda? Is that right? Is Hillary, let, no, let me just repeat the question. Um, the question here is that, do you think that the citizens themselves should take responsibility for the current state of civic and political liberties in Uganda? Do you think the citizens are responsible for the worrying state of civic and political liberties in this country? Okay, thank you very much and thank you for rephrasing the question. Well, from the start, I've made my stand clear in saying that as much as there are other bottlenecks to achieving the civil and political liberties in Uganda as a country, the big is in our leadership system, yeah? The current leadership system in this country. And in saying that, I am already saying it is not the responsibility of the citizens, it is not the sole responsibility of the citizens, and it is not our fault that we are where we are. Um, to the smaller extent, you could say we are to blame for voting people into power who did not represent us the way we expected them to. But still, the blame does not come to us in the overall because we would not have known that this, these are the kind of people they were going to turn into. By the time they were coming into power, they were making promises of heaven and earth and they were showing promise that they would be the leaders that we needed and look where they got us. So this is not our fault. We can find ways to dig ourselves out of this situation, but it is definitely not the citizens to take responsibility. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I've already uh, highlighted that the issue that we have mostly with achieving civic and political liberties in Uganda is with the current leadership system of this country. Um, going ahead to highlight examples of how our leadership has infringed on our rights as the people. There are several times, for instance, there was an election in 2016 whose results, a presidential election, whose results were contested and the people, a section of the people, demanded a recount of the vote, but it was never done. It, results are never given to us, and we are not sure we can trust our government and the leaders that we have chosen now. And several times we've given our views as the people to the leaders who represent us to go out there and represent these views, and they have failed to do so. Because in the end of the day, we do not, we, they are not accountable to us. They are accountable to their superiors as they have deemed. And those superiors are not also accountable to us because time and again, they've showed that with or without our votes, they can still get into power, yeah? and. In this system, we are seeing that there is no codependence. It is us who are de depending on the mercy of our leaders, rather than the leaders depending on our mercy in that we would see that, assess the work they are doing and decide if we need them or not. But the decision is not ours anymore. It is not ours to make. Because first of all, the fairness of the elections is always interrupted and elections have been rigged several times. And they said the margin by which the rigging occurred was small, so it does not re deserve a recount. We've seen those scenarios happening. And if we cannot hold our leaders accountable, that means there is no way we are going to change 
the situation in which we are stuck in. Because the systems that have been put in place right from the judicial system, where the courts themselves are now being accountable to the president, yeah? The chief justice is, is put into place by the president. How are we expecting the same president to be held accountable by those bodies of which he chooses the leaders for those bodies? It is not logical, ladies and gentlemen. The power needs to be given back to the people. That is the only way that we are going to move forward, that we are going to see our leaders get accountable to us, that we are going to see fairness, that we are going to see a citizen in the country recognized, our voices listened to, and our rights respected. Because okay. the reason that the people's rights are not respected is that there is no fear of the people. And the reason that the government does not fear the people is because we do not have any power. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Thank you for that. Uh, let me bring in Arthur. Uh, so Arthur, at this point, uh, please compare Uganda and other countries in terms of observance of civic rights and liberties. Uh, okay, we don't have we don't have us. Uh, okay, then let's let's bring let's bring uh, Felix on board as Arthur rejoins. Uh, Felix, um, can you compare Uganda and other countries in terms of observance of civic rights and liberties? Thank you so much, moderator, um, gender, and uh, the team that is now uh, having a discussion today. In comparing Uganda and other countries, uh, like I earlier said that uh, Uganda has actually created a very wide gap uh, as far as enjoyment of civil liberties is concerned. And like we have all discussed, most of these problems actually stems from the government and how the country is actually run. Now, comparing uh, Uganda to other countries, of course, there are going to be, there are countries which are actually are worse than Uganda, like maybe Rwanda. Rwanda is one of them, uh, where people are actually oppressed. The president says this and that is it, okay? To some extent, we are also there, uh, but we realize that much as we do that, uh, if you are to take into account, maybe you compare Uganda with uh, maybe Nigeria, uh, you talk of countries like Tanzania, okay, you realize that we are still far much behind. And as far as democratic governance is concerned, people cannot enjoy uh, civil liberties until uh, government actually rectifies uh, its misfalls, okay? Uh, for example, um, elections, okay? Um, there has actually been rigging of elections since uh, the 1998, 2000, and, uh, 2006, 2006, 2011, 2016, coming to 2020. Elections, elections rigging has actually been there. And it, it kept on taking place. If you have to compare with maybe Tanzania, which has already had a peaceful transition, you realize that uh, we are still behind, okay? As much as there is always going to be complaints here and there that this happens, this happens. Uh, but ours, uh, there is a monotony of power. And all we think is that uh, President Museveni is our only hope, okay? And they have successfully uh, gone ahead to actually create the gap between the rich and the poor, shifting from the Ubuntu to the capitalistic world and capitalism, which now makes us depend on them. And they are like God to us, okay? We think without them, and uh, there is actually no survival, and there is actually no future, which is why Azilari has actually been saying that uh, the most powerful house, which is the parliament, uh, is actually corrupted. You look at offices like the Office of the Chief Justice, which is actually appointed by the president. You look at offices like the Chairperson Electoral Commission, 
appointed by the president. Number one, I do not. You cannot expect the chief justice, um, maybe, uh, to have a court ruling uh, if there is, okay, at the highest court of Uganda to go against the government. Uh, it is it is something near to impossible. Okay, uh, the chairperson electoral commission to come and declare for us results, even when they know there were actually uh, vote riggings, even when they know that uh, the electoral process did not actually go well, like misuse of the state's powers and authorities, uh, and of course resources, uh, and lawful incarceration of maybe opposition leaders, intimidation of the people. Okay, like it has always been happening. Approaching approaching elections, you start seeing funny jets now moving around all over the country. You start seeing army deployment. Okay, when it is not time for elections, and it was okay, it is only now the the the, the, the lockdown which has now escalated things. But before this, after election, it just takes about a few period, and then you don't see the army any everywhere. But approaching elections, you now start seeing patrols, and then you be like, okay, uh, where were you? Uh, before this okay so there this has actually been happening and we have actually come short in such a way and you cannot compare this to other countries of course like nigeria of course they also have their problems uh, like maybe tanzania you talk of south africa but living developing countries i think uganda can actually uh start moving forward towards development okay if you are to compare uganda to a state like maybe uh, the united states where one um they actually use the two-party democracy they have only two parties and the electoral process is actually more i i i think there is actually more accountability uh there okay their leaders are actually accountable as, you're only you even, um, uh, yes and um you you realize that that kind of that kind of governance that kind of democracy is something that the democratic governance was actually formed to move towards and we have always come short thank you thank you thank you so much felix for that comparison uh let me bring in albert uh albert let's we would like to know where we are going so from independence to date how is Uganda faring in terms of observance of civic uh, rights and liberties? Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, for once yet another chance. Uh, uh, regarding to the question you've, you've passed on to me, uh, from independence up to date, I do not think there has ever been any government that has ever accorded the public its political and civil liberties. Let's first take a look into Oboti's governance. During Oboti's governance, those who had a right to education were few. There were few. Pass on to Idi Amin's governance. It was the uh, the most, I can say, too harsh. So, since, since independence, Uganda has never gotten civic and political liberties. I want us to go through this generation when Yura Kabutam Seven got into power. And uh, at first, people had rights. Because himself, at first, after joining the government, after that coup, he's the one who was like, let's have an election. <laughs> Let people contest. That was good. That was good. I give a credit there. But thereafter, we have seen several government de departments being corrupted. As Mr. Felix had said during this governance talk about the, the, the judiciary talk about the electoral commission all those and other departments of the government have been corrupted their heads are corrupted actually whichever department has a head that is nominated by the 
president, I'm sorry to say, it is corrupted. It is corrupted. We have seen results of elections, even when they know it is not the actual results, but the, the electoral commission still gives out the same results. I mean, the, the results that are not even fair. I can't say they are not fair, but as we can say, several districts have different study centers. You know, a district X had several votes, or a number to X votes, uh, district Y had votes named say S, but after all, after everything, to add it up, to announce what the results are, you want the results that, uh, that were X in a district Y now become results Y. That is something that we can't even understand. Come to judiciary. <laughs> We have state officials, we have government officers who have gone up to use their authorities to grab land from people. But when people go to the courts of law to, to run for themselves, to say something about themselves, about what is happening to them, nothing happens. Nothing happens. So before corruption is covered down, before we have all that, may not go any further. Uh, wh where we are going, unless we have changes in the governance, unless corruption is just out of Uganda, unless we be leaders, not politicians, we may not have a better future. While, uh, sometime back, a man was said that a good leader is he that goes uh, after as his you conclude, father. Albert, as you conclude. Yes, our, a man once said that a good leader is the one who comes after his father. But in Africa and even in Uganda, as our scope for today's topic, the leaders or the politicians, they go before the, the flock. This is what we can tolerate. Let the power go back to people then we shall have a better future. Without that, I think where we are going will not be good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Albert. Uh, before we move into our second last stage of this debate, I would like to pose one, Ms. Hillary. Earlier on, we heard about introduction of laws such as the Public Order Management Act. We talked about the Computer Misuse Act, the NGO Act, and so forth. I would like to pose a question at this stage. To what extent is the law being used to curtail civic liberties? The question to me, madam. Hello? Yes, to what extent? Uh, yes, Hillary, can you hear me? To, yeah. to, what, to what extent is the law being used to curtail civic and political liberties? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Well, first of all, the civic and political leaders, I mean, liberties of this country originate from our country's constitution, which is the law of this country. And in, in saying so, the law should be the primary reason that we are attaining the civic and political liberties. But as of, its, of the stand right now, the law is being ignored almost completely when it comes to our rights as citizens, and in that way, it is not helping because the law has been misused. The law has been misinterpreted in some cases and it has been ignored in other scenarios. It has even been twisted in some other scenarios as I'll go ahead to show examples. Now, um, I want to bring something to the light here. Um, when you compare Uganda to a country like Britain, well, in the first place, 
comparisons are good to help us realize that we are not yet there and to help us see how we can grow to where we want to be. The law in Britain is taken so seriously and surprisingly, their law is unwritten. They have an unwritten constitution which they follow much better than Uganda's constitution which has been written, amended, and still ignored, largely, ladies and gentlemen. So what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that the law could help in, in achieving rights and liberties in this country if only it is observed and followed to the dot. And how are we expecting, ladies and gentlemen, to observe the law when the law enforcement officers themselves cannot observe this very law? Okay. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Hilary. Um, uh, I see Arthur is back. I would like to bring in Arthur. Uh, we are moving to the second last segment of this debate, and we are now moving to the solution part, which is, so what, what should be done to ensure the observance of civic and political liberties in Uganda? Yes, yes, Arthur. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity. First of all, I think uh, what should be done mainly sensitization to know and uh, to inform both the government and the people to where their rights stop and where their rights start and which which freedoms are guaranteed by the by the constitution to not be uh, encroached on by the government. So that should be our, our main point of emphasis so that when we know where our rights are, when the government knows that these are the people's rights we cannot encroach, there people can, can actually, we can see that uh, at least the rights are being protected. That is the starting point of everything. But like I told you, very many people do not know that they have such rights. People do not know that uh, they have freedoms to, to, to express what they want and no one imprisons you. You see, they say that in Uganda, there's a saying that in Uganda, you have freedom of speech, but what happens after the freedom of speech? So people are afraid to speak out. So they, they actually don't have the freedom because if you're not sure what will happen to you after having said what you want, then uh, then you don't actually have the freedom of speech. So I'm saying that uh, our main point of emphasis, the starting point should actually be uh, 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 sensitizing the people, also the government, every member of the government, all the law enforcement agencies. This should actually be integrated into the school curriculum so that people, that school children you know that from grade one that they have, we have these rights, we have these liberties, so that these people, when they become presidents in future, they when they become uh, policemen, when they become army men, when they become whoever, members of parliament, the speakers of parliament, they can actually keep, uh, they can actually uh, make sure that these rights are not encroached on by the government. So I think that is uh, the, 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 the most basic thing. And uh, another thing I feel that there is need of an enforcement, we need a front, because, like I said, the government has uh, law enforcement agencies that uh, it inappropriately uses to encroach on these rights. We've seen the army time and again violating uh, rights of different individuals. So I'm saying that uh, we, we as the citizens, we as the people, we need a, a standing front. We need, we need a, a kind of enforcement to make sure that our rights are not encroached on. Because the government knows it can do everything it wants and no one will, will actually do anything. Because when, they, when, when people are trying to campaign for a fair and fair election and for you abduct them and take them to prison, when you, when you see people shooting with the machine gun, you see a, a, a man dressed uh, in, in an uniform shooting in, with a machine gun uh, in, in, in a town area, in an urban area, area filled with very many people, not knowing that people have a right to life, you see? So um, I feel as citizens, we need a front. We need uh, we need a stand. We need something to stand up to the to the government to act as as our fence also, so that they know that rights of people should 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 actually be protected. So that is why um, I, I, I will take a stand and and thank a different NGOs uh, that that actually standing in the gap so to say that this this what you're doing is wrong. So I'm calling upon different people who can actually form an NGOs. Or uh, as I conclude, that uh, who who can actually stand up and try to protect our rights. Thank you very much. Okay, 
Thank you so much, Arthur, for that. Um, I would like to go to Kakanda um, to give us your solution. What do you think should be done to ensure the observance of civic and political liberties in Uganda? Thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator. Now, uh, coming to look at the solution bit, as far as the enjoyment of our civil liberties is concerned, um, I think the most important thing is for us to understand our places, to understand our roles uh, in as far as being part of the country is concerned. And uh, of course, the government to take the lead in doing that. Number one, I would love to begin by uh, talking about uh, where our civil liberties are actually mostly uh, oppressed. Number one, um, I want to talk of the POMA, the Public Order Management Act. This is an act which allows for the use of minimum force, okay? Minimum force to maybe put a crowd which has gone out of order, back to order, okay? Now, the interpretation of this law, I do not understand how the police and maybe the armed forces understand it. Because um, in so many scenarios, it wasn't just tear gas, which I believe is not minimum force, okay? But live bullets were actually thrown. Live bullets, this is not minimum force. Okay, this is not the interpretation of the law. Even when uh, you go to the Police Act, uh, which was actually amended by the Constitutional Court, uh, Section uh, 36, which talks of um, limited force. Okay, now to what extent was it defined to the people who actually enforce this law that limited, and when you come to POMA minimum, means? So, one thing you should realize that is. Mm, these things need to be redefined. This particular uh, acts needs to be redefined, interpreted and explained properly well, such that the people who actually enforce it understands it. Now, secondly, um, I think when I come to when I, when I when I come to the part of elections, I think um, government should actually come to realize that maybe the incumbent needs to resign office first, okay? Or step down, give up office to someone to run it if such a person wants to run for office again during that period when he's going to do campaigns, when he's going to, such that certain things uh, like maybe misuse of maybe the public um, powers, misuse of maybe state resources are actually uh, not witness. Uh, this way we are going to realize that each and every presidential candidate is going to be considered as a candidate and at equal level, okay? Because um, that is what we are supposed to actually enjoy, okay? As a right, the right to equal treatment should be under the law. But you realize that even in the presidential debate, okay? Because President Museven is president, he's, he's, he, he's not stopped even when his time is up during the presidential debate it just continues and okay I, I there was a point where you say this is the problem with debates you don't get to say what what you want to say because of time and he was actually allowed to continue i think this is actually unfair to the rest uh, of the candidates and of course it would actually limit things like intimidation by police and uh, uh, brutality okay this this will also mean that resources will be accorded to each candidate um, equally, such that they all enjoy uh, the same the same rights. Okay, uh, but also um, moving out of there, I think it is also our responsibilities as uh, citizens, okay, uh, to understand uh, to what extent our actions should also uh, go as far as certain laws are actually what concerned. I have witnessed in so many cases that um, especially the youth, okay, when they see police around, they think all they interpret is that tear gas is there. So they will always find a way to do something to provoke the, the use of the tear gas, even when it was unnecessary. So I think all this should actually come to play. But also like Nyanzi also hinted, I think um, 
the constitution of the Republic of Uganda and other acts which are actually vital uh, to uh, due to the running of the states must be interpreted. One, constitution in all local languages. This way we are going to actually make uh, the country and the citizens conversant uh, with their rights, and uh, their roles and responsibilities. But also secondly, if only as, we as could- As you conclude, as you conclude. Uh, if only we could introduce uh, certain sections which looks at uh, maybe important clauses okay and chapters in the constitution of uganda uh, in universities because this is important just like ict is actually being used the moment you join university you go to campus or maybe tertiary institutions you're taught ict okay um of course, certain people miss it in a level so everyone is introduced to uh, computers and uh, technology uh, such that they get if we could actually use our constitution to interpret also certain things and we study something to do with law not just for lawyers okay that way we are Maybe going to actually and uh, we will realize certain changes thank you okay thank you so much uh felix for that i would like to bring albert into the discussion to give us the, the solution. So Albert, what should be done to ensure the observance of civic and political liberties in Uganda? Okay, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, as I had told you before, that's the bottleneck that we are having in Uganda. Regarding the topic, I cited out corruption unlawful and misuse of authority, <laughs> authority and forces. So to have everything back to normal or to have the move being uh, on, on smooth, number one, we have to fight corruption because if, even if we have a constitution and we have it being well followed. I, I don't think it can even well, be well followed when we have corruption in the country. We should first fight corruption. After fighting corruption, we can have the observance of the law in regard to the, to the constitution. Uganda is a, demo, a democratic country following a democratic governance. So we follow the use of the constitution. We have the laws well listed down in the constitution. That is what we should follow. It is our guideline pertaining the movement of the authority and governance. So, as in solving everything, we fight corruption, number one. Number two, we have the law in place and well for well enforced. And number three, we should actually, the government officials and even the government should try to elaborate what it means by the constitution and how to use the authority to which they attained when we voted them and how, where to deploy force and how to use it. Because we have police in Uganda the police, we have the UPDF. Uh, in simple understanding, the UPDF, the Uganda People's Defense Forces, it protects people with their property. Actually, it protects the country. I can say, let them be at the border, at the border of the country. Let them. Um. I cannot hear Albert anymore. Uh, I'm hoping it's not a problem from my side. So um, as we wait for Albert to get back, uh, let me bring Felix back. Uh, Felix, what role do you think can be played by university students to ensure the observance of civic and political liberties? Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Jenda. Okay. Um, I think um, university students are actually majorly uh, the youth and uh, taking Uganda into account, the largest population uh, of the country is actually the youth. And uh, 
also when it comes to other things, elections, influence, you realize that this is uh, youth activities mostly. Activism, okay? It is actually uh, the youth actually, they're the most doing that. And most of these people uh, in the universities, much as some did not actually uh, go to school, okay, unfortunately. But I think we all have got a role to play. Um, but talking about students here, yeah, majorly in the universities, number one, uh, we have a very key role to play in sensitization. Um, we also need to take into account that, uh, like Nyanzi at some point stated, that um, the citizens are to blame at some point. Okay, we should take into account certain actions that uh, we do, which insti which instigate violence in the community, um, which now uh, forces government and maybe its uh, officials to take actions. For example. Uh, during campaign rallies, certain people, instead of actually focusing and maybe staying in line with the rallies, you realize they were looting, okay? Uh, in cited examples, that there are very many that we realize. And in such beating up certain people, okay, maybe members of the, uh, of the government, there was a point in Kampala when if you wear uh, anything yellow, you would actually be beaten by the people and the border border where the border border community were actually uh, the people who, mostly they were the ones and of course people who work in the market i think it is our responsibility and uh, to understand and uh, sensitize people that uh, sat, at, at, sat, at certain points it is our actions that actually lead to certain um, brutality especially from the police okay uh, that is one thing that we can do sensitization for as far as uh, our roles and responsibilities in the society uh, is concerned, okay? Uh, secondly, um, I think we all have the powers and the abilities through the youth councils that we have uh, to speak directly to the government on uh, what we think uh, is the problem, okay? Uh, what oppresses us most, uh, what is our, uh, in our most fears and uh, what we think the solutions are. Now, this way we are going to be in position uh, to reach directly the government. And maybe, maybe I'm not saying this was never done. I'm not saying uh, it has ever, ha it has never happened. Uh, but I think uh, we need to be, uh, we need to be more, more consistent, okay? Um, on saying certain things because at some point People do not listen to you, uh, not until when you create a problem that uh, maybe by stating it and actually giving clear examples and coming to a very mature discussion that actually this is the way, this is what we expect, and this is what we want to be done. Um, of course, we also have our representatives in the parliament, uh, the house which actually uh, should have been the most powerful house but it is being manipulated uh, majorly by one side, of course, the income, the incumbent government, because one, they have the number, uh, but of also secondly, uh, there has actually been certain uh, cases of bribery, alleged anyway, uh, bribery cases that actually uh, forces them to play with, to actually give in to the demands and the ideas of the ruling party but not the good of the nation i think these are the people who should actually uh, be rich and um, made to understand what they are supposed to do and maybe for us and what we would do for them and what we expect of them okay um but also secondly i think universities are actually the most one of the most powerful institutions uh, we have in the country and um, I think the universities, uh, students of universities should actually come up with a body uh, that actually talks directly, not just to for, 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 for administration, but to, to, to the government, okay? Uh, on things that we think as students, of course, maybe you form something uh, on uh, 
that has departments you can talk on education on elections on governance on other things and it would have a voice uh, to give to the government and on how we think these things should also happen but also uh, we have a role to play as far as leadership is concerned i think we have got a number of leaders locked down in universities and after universities without interest in taking up leadership I think um, if we are able to have such mature and successful discussions, we can still do this for the community that we live in. And I think it is our responsibilities to actually take up this uh, mantle and go back to our communities and take up leadership positions. And in this way, uh, we might actually um, be in position to cut down certain problems that we have as far as civil liberties is concerned. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Felix, and thank you to all, all the panelists for today. We are going to have uh, our concluding remarks. You each have two minutes to give us your concluding remarks. I'm going to start with, with Arthur. Yes, Arthur, please give us your concluding remarks in two minutes. Yes, thank you very much. I want to applaud uh, your gesture. Uh, the Center for Constitutional Governance. Really, um, it, 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 this, this helps us to look into the country and see that there are things that we are not doing well, especially as far as uh, civil and political liberties are concerned. So um, this, this, like I said, the biggest problem we have is, is actually the people and sensitization and that we, we should all know that we all have a part to play in this. We all have something we can do as long uh, to, so as we can fight for these liberties. The only problem comes is that uh, everyone will blame the government, everyone will blame uh, the, the, the executive, everyone will blame the army, but then uh, our starting point should be us. I think that uh, everyone should examine themselves and say, what can I do to promote the, the political and civil liberties of myself and the people around me? Or what can we do? Yes, yes, because I'm sure everyone has a voice somewhere yeah, those who can let them post on their social media platforms, uh, those who can, so that we, we can sensitize each other. Let us not wait for, for UN to come and talk to the government. Let us not wait for ICC. No, I, I think it begins with us. That is why I'm saying that our biggest problem is the people. So I, I'm calling upon the people of Uganda, wherever you are, everyone, I'm sure there's something you can do. If you can talk to a friend, tell them, no, these are rights the government should not infringe. Because like I said, at the youth, we are the tomorrow. We, we are the leaders of tomorrow. So tomorrow, I'm going to be a president of Uganda. Hillary is going to be a president, uh, speak of parliament. Felix, we, we, we are midst, uh, I mean, I mean, I'm in a midst of greatness. So tomorrow, we are going to be the people running this country. So I'm saying that... Uh, if, if we, can, we, we keep on sensitizing the people that are going to lead tomorrow, people in universities, people in primary school, secondary school. So if we keep uh, sensitizing them that these are lines that the government should not encourage, when these people actually reach into government, they are going to actually ensure that uh, these liberties are protected. No matter what, that this is a red line no one should cross. So uh, that is what, what I'm saying, that the biggest thing is that we all have something to do. And uh, because we can do it, let us begin right here, right now, let us find them just the government and leave it to them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arthur, for your concluding remarks. Uh, let's have concluding remarks from Albert. Okay, thank you once again. Uh, uh, sorry, my... Oh, I want to thank this platform for giving us an opportunity, such an opportunity because it's on this platform that we can express what we feel about that. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would add that uh, more platforms may be feasible to which government officials can be invited and they hear from what we always say. That would be more, more efficient. And uh, still, I would urge us, all of us, university students, mostly university students, we are the power. At our age, I believe we can understand, we can see what is wrong and what is right, and we have time to see where to go, to vividly analyze where we should be going. 
So I call upon each and every university student. Let's take part in this. Let's be in it. Let's fight for our tomorrow. It's not me alone. It's not you alone. It's not her alone, but it is all of us. Before we go to sort of eat in the government or anywhere, let it start with us. Me and you, we can do better. We can put the country to where it is supposed to be, in the right hands. Thank you very much. Wish to see this happening once more. I'm glad to be part of this. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you so much. Uh, let's have concluding remarks from Felix. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator. Nyanzi uh, at Twitter for taking part in this. Uh, Albert Nchunguzi, Hilary Nyakaishiki. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, but also I want to appreciate CCG for giving us this platform and to discuss matters which uh, is actually uh, directed towards us and uh, maybe and the freedom and guarantees that we are supposed to enjoy. And of course, I also want to appreciate uh, Civic Space TV for uh, airing out this uh, and uh, allowing the people also to learn from uh, what we are actually discussing here. Uh, most importantly, I think there are key things that we have to note. Uh, number one uh, is that if our democratic uh, governance could be uh, tailored into transparency, accountability, and taking collective responsibility, uh, we will be put in a position where we will not need to uh, always be begging, okay? Uh, for our rights and uh, liberties, but we would be appreciating the fact that they are recognized, the fact that uh, our freedom is actually granted. And uh, it takes steps uh, one by one, okay? Uh, of course, a journey of a thousand miles uh, begin with a step. And I think this is actually one of the steps that could actually lead us there, which is why I'm so very much appreciative to CCG uh, for providing the platform and Civic Space TV. And of course, uh, Madam Moderator, thank you so much for taking us through a wonderful uh, deliberation. Um, I think much has been said. Uh, I would not say any more. Uh, goodbye. Thank you for the closing remarks. Thank you so much to everyone for watching. Today we have been having students of Ndeje University. We had Nyakai Siki Hilary, Rachkara Felix Kakanda, Nyanzi Arthur Victor, and last but not least, Muchunguzi Albert. And we were discussing the topic, which is the enjoyment of civic and political liberties in Uganda. What are the bottlenecks? It has been me, your moderator, like Agenda Fancy. And I would like to thank Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV that brought this debate to us. And we would like to end here. We meet again next time, same time, same place. Thank you.